in the working out of a great national program that seeks the primary good of the greater number. It is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But these toes belong to the comparative few who seek to retain or to gain position or riches or both by some short cut that is harmful to the greater good. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signs several important pieces of legislation in the 1930s, he creates the laws he calls the New Deal, the National Recovery Act, National Labor Relations Act, the Social Security Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. The New Deal is a response to the severe conditions of the Great Depression, when more than 25% of the workforce is unemployed, and it seems to many as if capitalism is collapsing. Once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower to the sun, brick and rivet and lime. Once I built a tower, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? These laws established for the first time the legitimacy of unions and workers' rights nationally and create minimum standards for employment such as the 40-hour week and restrictions on child labor. This is what today we call the social safety net. Steve's unemployment check is not as big as the wage he used to get, but it goes a long way toward buying groceries and paying rent. It helps keep his family going while the employment office helps Steve find a job. Other New Deal programs put people to work building roads, parks, national forests, government buildings, and even making art in public spaces. Socialists and communists had said for years that the country needed laws and programs like these, but until the Depression, such ideas were considered too radical. Now, novelist Upton Sinclair sees an opportunity to bring these notions into the mainstream. He drops his longtime Socialist Party affiliation. The California Democratic Party nominates him its candidate for governor. His 1934 campaign calls for production for use and turning over idle factories and land to working people. And they will be able to produce great quantities of wealth and to make comfort and plenty for themselves. We think that this is the true American plan. We say that it represents California's share of the New Deal. Sinclair wins widespread labor support, but loses the election when Hollywood movie studios force all the theaters in California to show fake newsreels supposedly showing tramps flocking into the state in expectation of a Sinclair victory. Presented as documentary films, these are actually entirely scripted and acted, including this interview. I'm going to vote for Upton St. Clair. Will you tell us why? Upton St. Clair is the author of the Russian government, and it worked out very well there, and I think it should do here. The New Deal is also responding to the growing number of demonstrations and strikes by working people often organized by left-wing groups. Some of these events, by their size and militancy, seem to verge on revolution. After 15 years of the open shop on the San Francisco waterfront, dock workers are sick of shape-ups of bribing bosses to get work and of making 75 cents an hour. When a group of rank-and-file longshoremen radical activists start up a newsletter agitating for change, they find a receptive audience. Section 7A of the National Recovery Act allows workers to join unions. Thousands of West Coast longshoremen stream into the International Longshoremen's Association, or ILA. They demand a union-run hiring hall, a 25 cent per hour raise, and a 30-hour week so that work could be shared equally. When the employers reject these ideas, 12,000 longshoremen strike the West Coast on May 9, 1934. The public is generally sympathetic. Many students come out to demonstrate their support. Sailors and other maritime workers join the strike. They want their own changes to deal with working 14 to 16 hour days, rotten food, and living quarters on ships and if Seth describes as bigger than a coffin, but smaller than a grave. They also want an end to hiring through employer-run 
Fink Halls. All the unions agree no one returns to work until everyone gets what they need. With 40,000 on strike, this is the largest maritime job action in U.S. history. An immigrant Australian longshoreman named Harry Bridges emerges from the ranks as head of the strike committee. Articulate, a brilliant strategist, Harry insists any settlement must be voted on by all members of the union. National ILA President Joe Ryan flies out from the east. Conservative and corrupt, Ryan feels more comfortable with the bosses than with these new militant West Coast unionists. He signs two agreements with employers. Neither contains any of the strikers' demands. Ryan attempts to explain at a meeting of thousands of San Francisco longshoremen. Unaccustomed to democratic unionism, he is startled when they overwhelmingly reject his settlements. Rank and file longshoreman Pirate Larson leaps on stage. This guy's a fink, and he's trying to make finks out of us. Let's throw him out. As he leaves, Ryan warns. Bridges does not want this strike settled. My firm belief is that he is acting for the communists. The employers open the ports with a massive show of force. They are determined to crush the maritime workers' strike. The bosses hire a thousand strike breakers in San Francisco alone, including hundreds of black workers who are barred from the union. This tactic is neutralized when the union, breaking with its racist past, approaches African-American longshoremen and asks them to join the union and the strike. Many do. On July 5th, other weapons are turned on the strikers. One witness reports, Struggling knots of longshoremen, closely pressed by officers mounted and on foot, swarmed everywhere. The air was filled with blinding gas, the howl of the sirens, the low boom of the gas guns, the crack of pistol fire, the whine of the bullets, the shouts and curses of sweating men. Everywhere was a rhythmical waving of arms, like trees in the wind, swinging clubs, swinging fists, hurling rocks, hurling bombs. As the police moved from one group to the next, men lay bloody, unconscious, or in convulsions, in the gutters, on the sidewalks, in the streets. Around on Madison Street, a plainclothes man dismounted from a radio car, waved his shotgun nervously at the shouting pickets who scattered. I saw nothing thrown at him. Suddenly, he fired up and down the street, and two men fell in a pool of gore, one evidently dead, the other half attempting to rise, but weakening fast. Longshoreman Howard Sperry is dead. A block away, so is cook Nick Bordeaux, who is volunteering in the strike kitchen. Not one smile in the endless blocks of marching men. Crowds on the sidewalk, for the most part, stood with heads erect and hats removed. Others watched the procession with fear and alarm. Here and there, well-dressed businessmen from Montgomery Street stood amazed and impressed, but with their hats still on their heads. Sharp voices shut out of the line of march. Take off your hat. The tone of voice was extraordinary. The reaction was immediate. With quick, nervous gestures, the businessmen obeyed. As the last marcher broke ranks, the certainty of a general strike, which up to this time had appeared to many to be a visionary dream of a small group of the most radical workers, became for the first time a practical and realizable objective. Against the advice of San Francisco Labor Council officers Edward Vandeleur and Mike Casey, 64 unions vote to strike. Seeing the writing on the wall, even the conservative council officers vote for a general strike. And then, strikers run the city. Workplaces are shut tight. With the exception of emergency deliveries allowed by the general strike leadership, virtually no work takes place. Laboring men appeared on the streets in their Sunday clothes, shiny celluloid union buttons glistening on every lapel. 
Common social barriers were swept away in the spirit of the occasion. Strangers addressed each other warmly as friends. Then it was the employer's turn to counterattack. City government and the media whip up public hysteria. An army of communists is marching on San Francisco. The strikers are going to starve the city into submission. In this atmosphere, hundreds are arrested. And so-called radical hangouts are wrecked in a massive effort to eliminate the imaginary alien red menace. After four days, Labor Council conservatives, over the angry objections of the maritime unions, call off the general strike. To you, Mr. Vandalore, as president of the San Francisco Labor Council and chairman of the General Strike Committee, and to your associates, I offer my congratulations upon your decision and the part it has played in bringing to an end the general strike in San Francisco. The inconclusive use of their biggest weapon convinces most longshoremen and many seamen that time has come to compromise. Longshoremen vote to submit all issues to federal arbitration and to end the strike. The sailors are unhappy, but know they now have no choice but to wait for arbitration too. But before going back, old Andrew Furioseth has the last word. He has his members build a bonfire to burn their think books. At work, the bosses awaken to a different world. Workers refuse to labor alongside strike breakers. Unsafe working conditions and speed up are rejected. The workers enforce their own new rules with direct action. When problems arise, they vote and strike quickly on dock after dock and ship after ship. Shape up and fin call are gone, and replaced by union run hiring halls. Workers govern their organizations through rank and file union democracy. Sailors Union leader Harry Lundeberg and longshoreman Harry Bridges bring together a powerful federation of maritime unions. The owners are furious, but maritime workers have learned how to take care of themselves. The fear is gone. Industrial unionism is established on the West Coast, and it's radical.